I do believe that everything can be tied to the organizational level metric. It may not be a direct one-on-one -on -one relation, but, but you have to find out how it relates. And if it doesn't relate, I would say question yourself. Maybe the tech debt can remain for another two years. Welcome to Concept to Care, where we hear candid stories of success and failure, discuss strategy, and dive into the details that offer advice on what to do and what not to do in health tech. Whether you're a seasoned pro, growing your career, or just starting out, our aim for this podcast is to be relevant, real world, and tactical. We're dedicated to not only entertaining you all, but also empowering you with actionable insights that can be applied beyond the podcast, one concept at a time. This is Angela. And this is Omar. Welcome to Concept to Care. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome my mentor, Smita Nair, to the show. Smita is the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Equip, a virtual evidence-based care delivery organization. Equip is dedicated to treating children, teens, and adults with eating disorders and co-occurring conditions like anxiety, depression, and OCD. In this episode, we'll dive deep into how Equip builds its product. Smita will also share how she looks for talent and builds high-performing teams. She offers invaluable tips for thriving in high-growth organizations. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Smita. Welcome to Concept to Care. Hi, Angela and Omar. Thanks for having me over. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Smita Nair. I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Equip Health, a leading virtual eating disorder provider. And um, I have um, close to two decades of experience working in healthcare startups, uh, notably um, companies like Evelynt Health, With Me Health, and most recently at Equip. Um, I'm an engineer, a uh, ton product person, because uh, I realized that I have the most fun when I'm tackling solving complex business problems. That's where I enjoy the most. And I've been fortunate to be in places where I got to do a ton of problem solving around how do you uh, bring technology to solve complex business problems in healthcare and really make a positive impact to patients and families and, and general population. Smita, uh, tell us more about Equip's model. Um, so who, who does Equip serve? What is the go-to-market strategy? What is the mission? And maybe some any other facts that folks should know about Equip? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we treat all kinds of eating disorders. We are a virtual eating disorder treatment program and uh, one of the leading providers in that space. Um, we have provided our services across all 50 states uh, in the U.S. And our model is based on um, where the patient is. So depending on the age group, you know, we provide family-based treatment, we provide treatment to adults. Um, so it's like we cover the entire spectrum and we are in network with most major commercial payers in the space, um, covering approximately 110 million lives across the United States. And you joined Equip and it's in a growth stage. How were you able to find that product market fit and how did you know that you hit product market fit? Um, I would say, I would start by saying that I think I was very lucky um, when I came across Equip because they had identified a, a big gap when it comes to eating disorder treatment. So by the time I landed um, in 2021 at Equip, they already had success in identifying the problem and coming up with the right solution for that problem. So when I came in, uh, my job was to make sure that, okay, how do we now hone in into this and how do we make sure that we can provide this at scale and continue to kind of iterate and learn uh, from what's working and what's not working. So for me, the biggest thing when I came to Equip and I was as I was making my decision was uh, Equip's focus on outcomes. Even then, when we were really, really small, we were publishing outcomes, we were focusing on data, um, and we were being very transparent about it. And that was very, very, like it just increased my confidence at a level that if a company at this early stage is so focused on clinical expertise and outcomes, that's the place where I want to be. There's a reason why I chose to be in healthcare and not in other technology companies, because that's what drives me personally, that mission of, you know, making an impact and uh, changing healthcare at least, you know, a little bit um, with my contribution. Road mapping as an activity, I, I often view it as kind of changes as, as with the stage of the company. So what makes sense today doesn't necessarily make sense tomorrow. 
Uh, given you were very early and going from zero to one with Equip, can you just talk to us about how you think about road mapping for that zero to one phase? And then we have a lot of, you know, I imagine there's commercial ambitions early on of growth to support the growth. Like how do you bring on more lives onto that platform to scale uh, and to support uh, contracts effectively? There is no one size fits all, according to me. Like even if we say early stage, high growth, different stages, I feel uh, the DNA of a company could change how you go about with the road mapping. So first and foremost, it was very important for me um, to understand what the opportunities are. So I did do kind of a listening tour, if you would, um, during my early um, weeks at Equip, to figure out like what are different people worried about, concerned about, what they wish they could have. So pretty much did that across all the departments. And... Um, I always um, keep reminding this to my teams, no roadmap should be set in stone. And that's true, right? Like we cannot proclaim to know everything that's going to happen from six months from now or two years from now. So yeah, it can be it can be a loosely, um, like directionally loose in a way that you can flex and you can see what worked uh, in terms of your delivery. So that's kind of one, like really understanding what the different opportunities are and coming up with some way of like alignment on if I'm thinking something is the the highest opportunity, uh, do other stakeholders, decision makers, do they think the same? If they all think the same, great, right? Easy, easy problem. But normally that doesn't happen. So how do you kind of get alignment? Either you shift your stance or you get others to shift their stance. Um, so that's very important and that's where I really believe in a very collaborative roadmap approach. Like I feel uh, a technology team should never have like, oh, this is technology team's roadmap. It should be the business's roadmap, right? Like what are we trying to do together? Um, so that has generally worked well for me. There are always learnings <laughs> every single time, but I think that's generally the process I take when it comes to road mapping. Keep it flexible, learn and iterate, um, drive as much alignment as you can, and the reason why I say as much as you can is because depending on the stage of the company, time is of essence. So you have to have a balance of how much alignment is good enough for you to experiment and for you to move on because there'll be a lot of time for iteration. I think there's always an interesting balance to strike as well. Like you, you mentioned roadmaps are not set in stone. 100% agree on that. It should be iterated over time. We should be flexible to shift gears and focus on the, the top most priority Engineering as a machine often works really well when things are planned. Um, and I'm wondering how do you navigate, you know, you, you set out maybe one, two, three quarters in advance. You say we plan to I implement these or, or work on these initiatives. Uh, we groom the work. We get it all shovel ready. How do you kind of navigate the, the, the balance of, you know, we need to be really flexible. We set out to accomplish five things might not accomplish those five things, but we still want to be within a percentage of like what we plan to do versus not plan to do. So how do you find that balance? What are some good ways to think about that? Yeah, and I think this is where I also want to bring up <laughs> when people say agile. Agile means, you know, we can just change things anytime we want. I mean, no, not really. Um, so I think the philosophy is you have to give the time to your teams to do the right to the to do the work the right way, right? So whatever the process is, um, but does that need to be a six month process? Uh, maybe for some initiatives it could be six month process, but for most it should not be, right? You you never want to write your requirements and your kind of prototype six months in advance because I'm pretty sure by the time you get to developing it, you would have changed your mind on it. So that's generally my philosophy. Like don't plan it that far ahead. Like what you can plan that far ahead is like the vision. And um, to kind of get buy-in from, you know, your business users, your your stakeholders and all of that. But you should never be, and, and I don't want to make this a blanket statement because I'm getting to this question from a lens of healthcare services, which is where, you know, I have spent most of my career. Uh, in that space, I feel a quarter timeline is pretty good enough from a prep standpoint. And I have also realized that um, our engineering teams are generally not, they really focus on like what's happening now and just image it. So if you, even if you start something like that's nine months out, it may not be the best use of everyone's time. 
that's how I deal with it. Um, there's, I think the second part of your question, the expectations management, it's a tricky one, but I think it's highly, I have seen product managers really succeed when they have highly collaborative relationship with their stakeholders, right? Because um, the one example that's coming to my mind while I'm answering you this is where the business understands the shifts even before we explain it to them, right? And and that's that's like nirvana in my mind where you don't even have to convince us to why something shifted, but they are so like aligned and they're so lockstep in sync with you that they know um, that, hey, you know what? We learned something new from our marketing strategy and we have to implement this now to get an impact now. So we are going to shift something else out and there's that alignment. That's great when you can achieve that. You had said that there are times where you feel like, hey, this thing over here is the biggest opportunity. Can you give an example of when that hasn't been the case and what you've been able to do? Did you change the roadmap because you saw their perspective or did, were you able to bring them along in how you were thinking about solving the problem? And if so, how were you um, able actually, to do that? I'm dealing with something like that right now um, where we've started with something that was a pilot. Um, I think from a commercial landscape, um, it's definitely uh, not just from a commercial landscape, but just from a modern health tech standpoint, the pilot is definitely sound and directionally what we should do. Um, but as I'm talking to like other um, execs uh, at Equip, we are just figuring out the cost benefit analysis on that. So even though I'm completely sold that that's the right feature to provide to all of our patients, but there are like other operational and other kind of business decisions that just doesn't make it maybe the right thing to continue. Um, and I'm I'm definitely like changing my stance on it from like, hey, we should go from pilot to all versus I'm rethinking, should we push that out by a few more months while we can do some other high impact work in that time frame and still pick it up? Uh, it doesn't have to be now. So um, yeah, I think I've done this more than once where um, even though I believe in something, it's the right thing for the patient. But I think if you start adding every single thing, um, are there other things that are more impactful for the patient and like doing that trade-off? So it sounded like you started with a pilot. There were a lot of learnings and you were able to take those learnings to be iterative in your approach. And so maybe this is a good segue for us to talk about if you're happy to share, you know, how you think about doing discovery at Equip. We, first of all, like we start with identifying the problem. Um, like that's generally a philosophy we all are trying to um, anchor on. Is like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And also, what is the outcome we hope to get? So kind of having both ends of that spectrum. And then within that, understanding who are the users, what's the impacted people, and kind of getting that perspective. So whether it's end users, whether it's people who are kind of peripheral to that, figuring out who the user base is, and um, understanding kind of the opportunity analysis from each of that lens and then putting a prioritization framework on like, okay, we can, if you could do everything, that would be great. But I have never been in a situation where we could do everything, right? There's always a trade-off. Um, so that's where you put some kind of um, agreed upon, you know, prioritization and scoring to see where do we go first and how do we kind of um, sequence it. Right. One of the things that I and my team generally does not believe in is like big bang releases. Like they always want to um, deliver iteratively and not wait for like nine months before we deliver a big project. So that's a huge emphasis. So how can we tackle this problem? Like, is there a first step to tackling it? Is there an MVP version? Uh, we have even gone like pre MVP version in some cases and say, okay, can we do this and just learn? Um, so we do believe in a lot of like iteration, but also like upfront, uh, agreeing on like, what is the problem we're trying to focus and what outcomes like, well, once it, once it gets implemented, what's the change you expect? You know, which KPI will change? What metrics will change? So we try to get some alignment on that. That way we avoid this trap of, um, you know, uh, feature overload <laughs> because, um, I have I have been in uh, product for so long where I just wanted my product to be perfect and you want to like put all kinds of bells and whistles, but you have to really be honest, like is that really going to change the outcome or is that really going to help for the problem too much? And if not, then uh, we, make, we make our decision based on that. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. And especially in that zero to one phase, I find that like 
everything is a is a crawl walk run at first and so i i think the big bang makes i i can't speak for, I, like i think for all of us makes us nervous <laughs> and we don't want a lot of big bangs we would prefer something small move like let's get some information on is this even working and then uh then we can make major investment in like tech enabling it further or automating it etc um, I wanted to ask you about the how susceptible the roadmap has been to this, the selling cycle. So it, selling in healthcare is hard and long, and it's hard to anticipate what are the requirements, but you know it's coming. And so how do, how do you kind of continue to plan and build without committing to a lot from upcoming potential deal closes? I have been in that kind of a situation in the past, like maybe two jobs ago, uh, but most recently at Equip. Thankfully, I'm not in that situation where we are driven by, you know, contract contracts and deals in terms of what features and capabilities we need because our contracts are with payers, um, health plans, and who we are treating are, are the actual patients and families. Um, so it is more around how can we deliver our treatment in the best possible way and how can we reduce kind of any kind of like healthcare waste, right? Um, that's an area that excites me the most. Like there's so much waste that happens in every point of coordination, every point of like healthcare touch, like what do we do there? Um, so thankfully uh, we are able to manage the timelines based on uh, like keeping, keeping our providers and our patients at the front and center and less by the contracts and deals. Um, so I, I would just say um, it's really good to be in this kind of a setup at Equip, um, but that's generally not the case in most other cases. Um, so I would just like add one more thing. In a situation where it is based on deal closing and stuff, like I have always had the, especially if you're building an enterprise platform, I always want to see um, if whatever the the particular customer is asking, can that be scaled across all? Like if it's very one-off custom, then I've literally uh, want more uh, more evidence as to why that is important and if we should really do it. So I do really push back on those kind of things if you're building an enterprise SaaS platform. And earlier you talked about being able to convey a vision and not being tied to certain feature sets. Can you talk about how you're able to convey a vision without... I mean, I feel like it's harder said than done where people like when you talk to them about your vision, they are just like, oh, that's a great feature. When are you going to deliver that? Um, yeah, I think I would take your question in kind of two two perspectives, right? One is conveying your vision to your own team, the technology and product teams as to what we're building. And the other is conveying your vision to kind of your business stakeholders to make them excited on why this is important. Um, so slightly different kind of approaches I would take there. Um, when I'm talking to my own team, I, the analogy I use is like, we all need to know, are we building, um, a, a, a castle? Are we building a religious building? Are we building a home? Like, what are we building? Like people need to know that. So that vision has to be painted so that when people are making decisions, micro decisions, um, about what kind of wall, what kind of wall color, like they have that perspective that this is the end state that's going to look like. Um, so that's one way I do it. Like, what are we trying to to build at the end of it? What's our main goal? Um, but also like, it's exciting for people, right? Like changing this nav, uh, all of that, like where is it leading to? And being in healthcare, I feel like that's really, um, we're, we're honored to be working in healthcare because it's really easy to find that mission connect. Like most people who come to work in such companies are missionally aligned already, right? So for them, what really matters is, okay, how is this going to change the life of a patient, life of a provider? How is this going to impact the healthcare we are providing? That's what they are driving uh, towards. So painting that vision is easier and, and so authentic. Um, when it comes to stakeholders, um, I would say, um, I mean, they're also missionally aligned. So all of those statements still hold true. But it's very important because they are also not coming from a place of like, many of them may have not worked in an organization where products were built internally, right? Maybe they were using an ex externally built EMR and things like that. So this is where I 
would love, I, I love to use like as much storytelling as I can to paint the vision, but also like how can we uh, get prototypes, um, you know, some visuals to, to make it a little bit more concrete and not leave it to too much interpretation. So yeah, those are some of the tactics I use. Um, I've seen this play out in a couple ways at a lot of tech enabled healthcare services. Right now, you are you're, you're chief of both product and technology engineering, right? Um, as a person who's grown up in product, what are the biggest considerations for, uh, like starting an engineering function or having the engineering function roll up to you yeah, at a startup? How do you think about making decisions, and how do you provide oversight in an area that you haven't spent the majority of your career focused on? Um, yeah, definitely. And I would, I would be very honest in saying when I, uh, took my kind of first role in that capacity, one of the things that I said to myself is that I'm going to be very honest about what I'm really good at and what I'm not good at. And I would even say that even in the product discipline itself, there are so many things, right? User research and user design and product. Um, I'm not an expert in all those. I think building the right team is the most important thing for me um, to make sure that I'm doing right by the company. Um, and that was my focus. Like, how do I make sure, um, one, I know my own strengths, but I also know what my biggest gaps are and finding the people who are really complementary to that. Um, so yeah, I've, I've built a very, very strong team here at Equip, um, especially our VP of engineering. He comes with lots of years of engineering expertise and very, very high kind of a bar for excellence. Um, so that's important. Um, so, so building the right team. The second is, you know, enough to be dangerous, right? Um, how do you drive kind of accountability? How do you make sure that you're very clear with people on what you're looking at and how are you looking at success versus what's not going well? That way it gives you an opening to kind of ask deeper questions as to, Hey, what's happening here and what can we do? And sometimes, you know, you may not exactly know what's wrong, but those questions, those probing questions will give you more insight into, okay, something is not as good as it should be and what are we going to do collectively do to do, change that? That's Those are some of the techniques kind of I follow. And I generally like being in a startup, to be honest, every single time I take a new opportunity, I'm always looking at how can I contribute with all the things I'm good at, but what can I also learn for myself? Like what's my growth in terms of learning? So um, I think this role expansion in that regard is is a part of that for me and then eating disorder space is another part of it right like I've, even though i've been in healthcare i've never been in behavioral health so there there always like the point i'm trying to make is there's there'll be always something that i wouldn't won't be an expert at but what you need to know is what are signals you're looking for when things are going well or not going well and do you have the people who share a kind of a relationship where they can be open about it and discuss and problem solve with you you talked about the accountability, and it sounds like at Equip, there's shared accountability across the organization. Could you say oh, more yeah. about that? I would say um, this is one of the best uh, implementations I have seen about of you know putting uh, OKRs, objectives, and key results in practice. Um, so we all have um, company level OKRs, but then each department derives their own OKRs from that, um, which is pretty much. Uh, driving the collective KPIs of the, the top level KPIs of the company. So every single thing that product engineering is doing is hitting one of the business KPIs that at the company level we track. And that's, that's like a really powerful tool to drive alignment because, um, you would hardly see people working on stuff that's not attached to those, um, high level KPIs. And then, we do have like a very um, rigorous review every quarter. So we just, we just don't like write them at the beginning of the year and then forget about it and then look at it at the end of the year. No, so there's a continuous like looking at the KPIs and saying, okay, what has changed since we last set them? Do we need to revise it? So there's a lot more like focus on understanding the change and adapting to that change. Uh, but at the same time, driving accountability so that people are always clear on what will um, success look like for a particular team uh, or even for a particular role. I think that when someone's listening to this, they could think, okay, like that makes sense if your work is tagged to a KPI or an OKR that is driving revenue, right? Like that is very attractive. In that model, how do you drive accountability for work that is more keeping the lights on or tech debt? I personally believe that 
all of that touches on something that's at a higher level in the business, right? So even for tech debt, like, okay, why do you care about tech debt? Um, because you're trying to scale. You don't want this to slow you down. So you're looking at the scaling metric, right? Are you able to support the growth that your business is seeing on the platform that you have? And if you have a tech debt, maybe you can't uh, grow 2x next year. So I feel like even the tech debt, like we do, um, and this is a real example, like we do have a tech debt work stream and that's actually uh, attached to our growth work stream, right? Because we can all choose to say, you know what? We can live with this. We've lived this for two years. Why fix now? But we are fixing because we are growing at a rate and we don't want to carry that tech debt into the next phase of Equip. So I do you believe that everything can be tied to the organizational level metric? Um, it may not be a direct one-on-one -on -one relation, but but you have to find out how it relates. And if it doesn't relate, I would say question yourself. Like, why are we doing it? Maybe that tech debt can remain for another two years. One of the things that we talked about when um, we were talking about you leading product and engineering was building the team. And so I really feel like this is one of your stealth secret superpowers. <laughs> um, you know, you have largely built um, teams at organizations that you've been at. And I think you have a little bit of an unorthodox approach here. So would love it if you could share about how you think about talent and finding people and unlocking their potential. Yeah. Um, Angela, when you put it this way, it feels like um, you're telling that I have some kind of a secret power to identify that. But honestly, I don't. And I wish I did. <laughs> Right. Because uh, that would be so cool <laughs> just to know like who's the right person when you talk to so many individuals and like this is the right person. I think I, I look at it from a lens of like when I was early in my career um, and when I didn't know so much about product market fit and revenue and what the companies are doing, what did I care for most at that time? Um, I personally care cared a lot for like learning um, and the kind of people I got, I'll get to work with. Right. Um, so can I look up to some people who are working around me and can I learn more new things? So those were like really important. And then the third part was also like, am I also having fun while doing the work that I'm doing? Because, uh, the reality is that we all end up spending a, a major portion of our life at work. Um, so it better be a little bit fun, uh, and not like completely draining. So those are the kind of three things I looked for. So when I'm looking at people to join, my team, I'm definitely looking for um, curiosity, like how curious are people? Uh, because that, especially in a startup, right? Like nothing is going to be um, super clear. There'll be a lot of ambiguity. And if you're a curious person, you will be able to find your way through that ambiguity and bring clarity to others because people are in many cases relying on you to bring that clarity. So finding, um, you know, examples of like how curious they have been in their career leading up to now is, is, is one way for me to look at that. Um, second, um, and don't ask me how I found this because I don't know. Honestly, I just don't know how I find this is how hungry are they? You know, I remember Angela, you from many, many years ago. And I, I put you as like, you were a very hungry person. Always. You're always wanting to do more things. So um, <laughs> sometimes you just get that vibe uh, or you get some examples from their past and things that they have done, like how how happy are with their, their status quo? What else? How did they push themselves? How did they push an initiative at somewhere? Like, So that's a very important component for me. Um, I think another word for that would be like high agency that um, many people use. Like, uh, do you have high agency? So I think those two things along with like, integrity um and like are you a generally like nice person to be around are my three like non-tangible things um obviously the other competencies have to be there like if i'm hiring an engineer they better know you know the tech stack that we're going to be working in if i'm hiring a product manager they better know the the product manager concepts and the frameworks and things like that um that's a given that's a baseline but these are the other things i really I really focus on and then um, I focus on good people, no good people. So harnessing the network is super important always. I'm laughing because you said that I'm I'm hungry and I, I would say that for people who know me, I'm, I'm hungry in uh, I think more sense than one. <laughs> True. Once you've hired those individuals, tell us a little bit more about how you create a culture of high performing teams and from from top to bottom. Some of the things 
I follow and I hope like people who report to me can watch for this. Uh, but I try to make sure that the roles and responsibilities are very clear. I feel like there's nothing more, um, you know, distracting than not being very clear on what the expectations are and what your role entails. So I try my best to make it as clear as possible, the roles and responsibilities. And then, um, as I mentioned before, that we do focus a lot on KPIs and OKR. So like making very clear that what are the different key results that we, each of them are responsible for. But at the end, what is the collective accountability, right? Like as a team, like tech and product, like if every single team did their own KPIs, but if the collective accountability was not there, then that's a miss. Um, so do really focus a lot on that collective accountability that either we all win or we all lose. So what what will it take? So really re-emphasizing that is important. And um, third, I I. I truly enjoy the people I'm working with, right? So um, I, I feel like we have a relationship where I can be very honest with them about what has made me super happy and where I'm like, oh, this could have been done better. Like I can be very honest and vice versa. Like they are all super honest with me about, you know, all kind of feedback. So if they're worried about something, they're very honest. If they need help, then they're very honest. If they're sometimes just venting that, oh, I wish this could be different. Um, so I feel like, I personally enjoy that I can provide that platform um, both ways where I can do the same with them and they can do it. I think that just creates a very psychologically safe environment that if somebody is facing a problem, it's not just their problem. Like we are all here to solve it together. I would rather know the problem versus like not know of the problem till six months. And then we're like, oh, now we are in, in a soup. Um, so I think those are the Three things like roles and responsibilities, um, making sure that people know what they're accountable for and um, creating a space where people can bring up anything and everything. Inevitably, when you hire people, um, you can make the wrong hire. And the impact is disproportionate when you're at a startup and there are very few people around. Sometimes you look behind you, there's no one behind you, right? And so can you tell us um, if this has ever happened to you? And if so, what did you do? And was there any, were there any learnings that you took from that? Um, I wish I could say, no, it has never happened to me, but it has. <laughs> um, and I think this is the the balance of, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're in an early growth stage company, you know, there's a sense of urgency, right? We all have, and I definitely have a lot of sense of urgency because the moment I see there's so many problems to be solved, I'm like jumping into how quickly can we solve it and what can we do? And hiring is important for that because as a team of one, I cannot do it. So sometimes when you shortchange that thorough vetting with quick hiring, I feel that's when uh, some of these things come up. And honestly, um, like at this stage of my career, I don't think it's ever a question of the technical skills per se, right? Like people people will know what they know. Um, but mostly what I have found out is um, there's a lot of, when I say it's a bad hire, it's mostly a cultural misalignment, Right. Maybe this is not the kind of work environment they envisioned or maybe um, they were operating as more of a hands-on person and now here they have to lead a team. So there's a different level of step up. Uh, that's and, and sometimes you give you take a leap of faith and you say, hey, this person is going to do it. But, you know, when they were very good at level A, but maybe they can't be equally good at level B. So... Um, those kind of situations have happened with me. And in those cases, I think clear as kind is always the strategy. Like, first of all, you want to make sure that you can make it work. Um, and are there gaps that can be closed? But then if there is no, um, for whatever reason, right, whether it's because of me or because of the other person, if the two parties cannot come to some kind of alignment, right, then it's better to kind of part ways because it's not good for that person. It's not good for the company. Um, and, um, like you have to kind of make sometimes a mutual decision that this is not the place um, for the person. So it does happen, especially when you're trying to move fast. Um, and sometimes it's not because of the individual in themselves. It's because of the environment, the kind of setup and the kind of expectations you have of that role. There are a lot of reasons that would influence why you would need to change the way your team is organized. In the past, you've described it as putting puzzle pieces together. Um, can you walk us through your thinking process here? How do you organize teams? Um, how do you think about permanence versus and, and ownership? I think my basic principle when I'm thinking about teams is how do we avoid the burden of coordination? 
there will always be coordination across silos and across different teams and across but can you minimize that right uh, because you don't want the entire time productive time to be spent in just meetings and the whole teams being in meetings and then um every single person of the team being in a stakeholder conversation so like how do you kind of streamline that that's like definitely one of my bigger thing that how do i do that and also how do you bring clarity on who's responsible um so those two things kind of play front and center for me when i'm thinking about teams so an example would be in the earlier years of equip when we were building our mvp our teams were more driven by like the platform itself because we were we were going to the race of the mvp platform build and it was like platform 1 and platform 2 and we had teams building those but as now we are in like year 4 or 5 of it uh we are aligning more to our business teams so we have teams that are focused more on the clinical side of things we have teams that are focused more on commercial then we have teams on the patient side of things and that is because now we are at a stage where we are trying to like fine tune um what else do we do uh, what metrics uh, what outcomes do we need uh, what are the different stakeholder conversations that we need to be part of and we are trying to embed more and more into business uh when it comes to products so that's how the product teams have evolved and but the the principle still the same right like are you trying you're trying to minimize the coordination required and you're trying to um make sure that people know what they're accountable for in each of these streams um the second part of a question about like permanence i don't i don't believe in permanence at all <laughs> because i feel like uh, uh i don't know uh, angela like you you have experienced some of it with me um back at a prior company but i feel like the moment you start believing in permanence then you start doing suboptimal processes just to meet the needs of that permanent structure versus the other way around right um so i always um say to everyone like okay this is what we're doing now and this looks like a good setup for the next 6 months but if tomorrow like our business shifts or if we have to focus on a completely new product area we should all be ready to dissolve the structure and get into a new uh but the the, the promise that i have the the one thing that will be permanent is that you'll get to solve exciting new problems that will be permanent um but in which team structure which combination that's not permanent smitha i stole a page from your book and i i always tell people you are dating your product you are not married that's to right. your product <laughs> um <laughs> which i remember you you always said to me tell me more about that because change is hard right you own a product and you learn everything that there is to know about that product area and then so to change it and maybe to change the org where maybe the reporting structure is different and your ownership area is different can be hard and how do you manage that type of change yeah um it, it is hard and i also don't want to like trivialize by my or- early response that hey we can just change things when we want i mean that's not the idea right like you want to provide stability as much you can because there is benefit in that there's benefit in those relationships there's benefit in certainty and all of that um so any time when you're changing there has to be a very good reason for change maybe there's a business change maybe there is a new product initiative so there is something that is definitely exciting that's happening and because of that you're driving the change right so if it's if it's driven by that kind of a logic and change i think it's very easy to convey that to your team members like this is why we're doing it and then yeah you you may have to learn a new construct area and things but this is where i go back to like my hiring principles of like i'm i'm trying to hire people one who are hungry and second who are very curious right so this is a good opportunity for them to like open up those doors of curiosity and making sure that they're learning maybe a new domain altogether or a new construct and things like that so i feel like you you want those kind of people who are open to that possibility but also understand the strategic rationale as to why you're doing it um and it's important like we all i mean if a change is happening to me i would want to know why and i would expect people in my team to ask me the same why and i should have a good why We are going to talk about our next set of topics which is all around working in high growth organizations which you've worked in a lot of them um in your career. 
which is incredible, right? And we've all read the stat that 80% of health tech startups fail. Can you tell us a little bit about how you evaluate organizations to understand the opportunity and whether or not it's an endeavor that you want to bark on and, and whether the opportunity is there for it to grow? Um, yeah, uh, this is, I feel like it's a, it's a tough question um, because it's, I don't completely take a scientific approach, to be very honest, right? I'm not like looking at um, the revenue statements and doing all of that. Um, I, I know some people who do that, exactly do that and go with that. My, my take mostly is, um, I really look at the mission of the company. Like, what are they trying to do? Um, and is that something that I feel proud to be associated with? Right. That's very important for me. That is this something that I want, uh, to be a part of? Um, so that has to resonate with me first and foremost. Um, then I definitely look at the leadership team. Um, as I mentioned before, like I want to be surrounded by people that I'm inspired by and that I can look up to. Um, and more importantly, like are they passionate about it, right? It's no fun working in a place where if you are the most passionate person for that team, like you're looking for um, what is the passion and how are people driven to work on this particular mission. So I do look at that aspect. And again, these two points that I said so far is no guarantee about this company featuring in the 80%, right? <laughs> it's not. I also now at least do look at like, what is the problem that they're trying to solve for? And as much as I can, with my expertise in the industry, figure out some rationality in that. Like, is this a problem worth solving? Or are there already 100 solutions out there that have solved the problem? Um, so that's another kind of um, perspective I try to gauge. And then fourth, because I have worked in healthcare companies and more and more like the recent one as such as Equip, I did focus a lot on the clinical expertise. I was very sure that I didn't want to go into a digital health company, which was focused on the technology build and not the clinical part of it. And Equip was clinical first and that really resonated with me. I wanted to make sure that there's strong clinical fundamentals and outcome, focus on outcomes, um, uh, because then, you know, we can solve the technology problem. Then we can build the right tech to do that. But that's the fundamental I wanted to be very sure of. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the things um, I look at. I want to, want to dive deeper into the, the stages of a company. So how do you categorize the various stages of a uh, high growth company? What should people need to know about each stage and how to operate within them? I mean, generally, I think that the most common stages that we all know of are like, you know, Startup stage, early growth, um, scaling stage, and then mature um, stage. So I would kind of remove the mature stage from our, our definition right now. In startup stage, it's very important to be lean and agile, right? And um, we talked about roadmap. It has to be very, very flexible. Like the level of flexibility of roadmap has to be another level in a startup stage. Um, and you are also working hand in hand with like the founders and the founding team members on understanding the product market fit. So there has to be a lot of, um, I feel irrespective of your titles and where you are in the organization, a lot of ha all hands on deck approach to find that what's working, what's sticking, where do you need to iterate? And really uh, like this is not the stage where I would focus on tech debt, for example, right? This is where you would want to like quickly iterate and learn. When I talk about early stage, this is where you would start having a little bit longer term roadmap so that people can start looking at the vision. I do focus on putting a little bit more, you know, mature product development processes, you know, in terms of how do we manage our roadmap and how do we do our different ceremonies, like bringing some structure in. I do start looking at that in that early stage phase. And scaling stage is where I would be getting into more, like now you have the uh, I would say the luxury of um, focusing on some core problem areas and making sure that you're doing user research. Um, you are having a little bit more baked roadmaps. Um, you're focusing on tech debt because now you're in the scaling mode and you're focusing on, um, I mean, security is always the underpinning of it, but trying to get into more of like getting those attestations and those 
uh, security frameworks kind of implemented so that you can be a trusted source across. Like those are the kind of things I start focusing on in the scaling stage. So yeah, more more defined process, more uncertainty because now you may have higher user base. So like that one single bug could cause more heavy disruption than when you were a very early seed startup. So focusing, like not becoming too heavy early on because you are trying to learn, but then as you get into scaling, putting more structure and frameworks across all of your teams. And can you tell us a little bit about how you balance being strategic with being responsive to things that come up, either issues or learnings from your discovery? It is, as you said, it is a balance. Strategic in the sense of like, are we, have we, have we defined the lanes? Like that's what I call the strategy, right? Like, and then how, how we operate within those lanes is the tactical part of it. Um, and we generally do yearly and a mid-year process to kind of refine the roadmap at the higher levels and say, okay, this is this, does this still hold true? Has something else changed? Are we still committed to kind of the resources and the roadmap priorities we all set? Do we want to shift something else based on what we, are, we saw in the first six months of the year? So we do that kind of intentional exercise around road mapping, uh, which is more strategic. And then it could also happen because of a trigger. So maybe there was a market event that happened and that that raised a discussion for us to uh, focus on like, okay, what should our strategy change? So we are not like waiting for that mid-year check-in because of that trigger happened before we would um, come get, get everyone in the room and discuss what needs to be done and what the recommendation would be. It's it's really hard. The other piece of it where there's always priorities that will come from the operations teams and things that are important. So it's always figuring out what's important and urgent versus what's important and not urgent. And I feel like my, my product team does a fantastic job in always like weighing that um, and uh, making making the call and making sure that the people who are requesting those things are in the loop on why we think it's important and urgent versus why we think some things are important and not urgent to do right away. So yeah, it's it's still a balance. And I don't I don't think we get it 100% right all the time. Um, honestly, I still think that I could spend more time being a little bit more strategic. And there's always this balance of how much and when. Smita, I, I get it from Angela all the time. She men- mentions you, but even through this conversation, it, it's clear that you lean into your strengths really well and you mitigate, you have mitigation strategies for, or either work on or have mitigation strategies for weaknesses. How do you discover for, for those who are listening, like if you were to give them the playbook, how do you discover strengths within yourself? And then how do you advise others uh, on, you know, that are reporting into your function to do the same and lean into that same way you do? A lot of hard feedback along the years is the answer to that. <laughs> Uh, and I would say uh, as much as a feedback stings, but it's truly a gift and obviously not my, it's a very cliched statement. Uh, I think somebody else has said this, but really believe in it. It may feel very hard when you get that feedback, but that's the only way for you to grow. Because if you take that feedback and say, okay, what am I going to do about it? And how am I going to like change this? Or sometimes you can't change what you are at the core. How How am I going to be aware of this is the way. I go about it, right? Like awareness of what you're not super good at so that you can complement, as I said before, is super important. I have personally been also lucky to be part of some like exercises where, you know, we did Strength Finder. Um, I'm forgetting the exact assessment name, but there's something called a Strength Finder. So we did that and um, it was surprisingly very apt. Um, and sometimes you just don't know. And when people look at your results and like, oh yeah, I see it. Then I'm like, oh really? <laughs> you, just, you do see this. So I think that has benefited me, like finding, getting that perspective of like what my strengths are. And then over the years, like a lot of 360 feedback, right? Upward, downward, all kinds of feedback has really highlighted, you know, what things I do well and where I can still keep improving. So I think to all the listeners, one thing I would say is that really treat feedback as a gift and change your mindset around that. Like it's, if somebody is giving a feedback to you, they are most likely invested in you, right? Because if they were not invested, avoiding conflict is the best way for it. Like everyone wants to avoid conflict. But if somebody is, get, they've gotten past that and giving you a feedback, that means they really care for you and they want you to, you know, rise, uh, rise about that. So treat it that way, work on it and uh, 
Even if you can't completely avoid some things, be aware of it. All right, Smita, we have reached the very exciting concept closing call portion of the podcast. And the first question is, are there any frameworks, methods, or processes that you found especially useful in your work that others may find useful as well? Oh, that's a loaded question because I feel like, first of all, I've stopped reading many books these days, don't have enough time, but I read so many blogs and articles and podcasts. And there's so many frameworks, like they're getting bombarding you with frameworks and frameworks. And I'm like, okay, I was doing this. Is this what it's called? (laughs) Uh, So with that said, I feel like my, the things that I always lean into is, um, I think it's called design thinking, but like empathy, right? Thinking about your user, keeping your user front and center and thinking about the problem. Uh, That's a framework I live by. Um, Not just in product, like I feel like in every single interaction, if you're thinking about the person in front of you and then you are handling the conversation, I think it always has a better outcome. Um, So that empathy is super important. Um, And just by the nature of where I've been at, like early stage startups, um, the lean startup methodology has always helped, right? I I never had the luxury to build the perfect, you know, product in the first go. So you have to always iterate. So really, I, I really do lean into the lean startup methodology and always think about how can we iterate? How can we deliver in, increments and and move forward. What is a tool that is highly valuable to you and that you think others may not be using? My one-on-ones. <laughs> I do use a lot of one-on-one times um, with my skip levels, with my directs, with my stakeholders. And I feel like those are very important because that's where you are able to get to the bottom of things that doesn't come up in larger meetings and you really understand uh, what's um, blocking somebody and I feel like a big part of my role in the organization right now is uh, how can I unblock <laughs> um, various initiatives, what what people are working on. So I think those um, those one-on-ones have been really helpful for me to really understand where things are at and where I can provide more support. Smita, were you the one telling me that you have office hours? I do. <laughs> I was planning to, I was talking to like my... Um, person who who supports me is like okay we should open up like maybe every other friday like some office hours but my team does a lot of office hours just so you know like as a product team they during every launch and stuff they would do office hours and people show up and it's just a great way to provide this um in a virtual environment providing this like virtual open door concept for people to come in and talk to you are there any concepts in healthcare that excite you right now concept that has always, always excited me is that um, I'm always looking at how to reduce waste in healthcare. And there's so much everywhere um, in terms of how we deliver care, in terms of what patients need to do to get care and things like that. So that's the area that's always exciting for me. And I think in 2024, um, there's so much more like given how technology has progressed, there's so much more we can do in terms of making it more and more efficient for our providers, for patients and everyone. I'm super excited with the bills that are happening now and what we can do, Gen AI included. But like, how can we make it just easy? Things that are that's manual, tedious, like remove them. And how can we really help everyone operate at the top of their license? So that's kind of my dream. Like when I've done that, um, at least at Equip, like is everyone operating at the top of their license and not doing stuff that they, they should not be? I would be I would be a truly happy person. Do you think product management is science or an art? I think it's a mix of both because if you're thinking about things like market research or data analysis, like backing your hypothesis with data and all of that, like that, there is some amount of science in there. Like you got to know what, what works and how do you analyze and what, what you should present, how you should convince. Uh, But the other part of it, like, you know, the storytelling, the um, UX, UI, um, all of that, like there's a lot of art in that. Um, and sometimes, like I always, um, especially when it comes to designers, I don't think like the number of years matter as much. The number of years of experience, it's like you either have it or you don't. And uh, so there are a lot of aspects of product management that is art. But the way to be truly successful is a good mix of both. Because if you lean heavily on one, let's say you lean heavily on science, then you may get into this analysis paralysis mode. 
and not be able to make like the right decision based on like other qualitative things you're seeing. And if you lean too much on art part of it, then you may just end up building something really beautiful, but may not um, get you the outcome that you intended to be. So a mix. I'm still striving towards that. Haven't achieved it. And uh, Smita, last question. Do you have any shameless plugs or do you need our audience to help you with anything? We are hiring at Equip. And if you want to work in a fast-paced technology team, product teams, ping us, uh, ping our talent team. Um, We have been featured in some of the top lists of startups uh, in Time 100 and Fast Innovators. So really exciting. Like we are enjoying what we're doing. And as I said, like we we believe in having fun. So that's my shameless plug. Come work for Equip Health. We are hiring for lots of exciting roles. What kind of roles do you have open? We are always hiring for uh, software engineers. We do have um, product manager positions that open up uh, frequently. I, I don't know if there's one open currently, but we do have those come up uh, regularly too. And there are lots of other roles in our um, you know, commercial teams and clinical teams. We're always hiring for therapists and dietitians and all the providers. So plenty of jobs. Smita, you are a huge inspiration to me. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure talking to both of you. Um, it was a wonderful chat. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show. If you liked this episode, don't forget to leave us a rating and a review on your podcast app of choice. And make sure to click the follow button so you never miss a new episode. This episode was produced and edited by Marvin Yue with research help from Aditi Atreya. We're Angela and Omar, and you've been listening to Concept to Care.